Hello, guys, and welcome back to La Cancha. And wow, it's we thought we were done with the terrorism of football, Oscar, but it came back in full storm this week, didn't it? I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't watch any of this. <laughs> yeah. Listen, listen, for, for because of like school, I know I couldn't watch every game live. I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I did most of the hard work and heavy lifting for you. I watched most yeah. of the games, even yeah. at Tafe I, I, Valencia. <laughs> the most okay. interesting game in terms of fouls. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I went back and like found out what happened, but then I was like, thank God I didn't spend 90 minutes. Plus. <laughs> Yeah, so so let, let's start with Sevilla because they're the highest placed team in the league at the moment. And again, yet another draw away from home. And we thought like their title was on slim margins last week after the draw in Alaves. It's straight over right now, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's been over for a couple of weeks now. Barring a serious disaster, which doesn't look like happening. But Real Madrid said, I think, yeah, we can acknowledge that Sevilla have been unlucky with injuries, but the way they've been playing away from home hasn't helped them either. No, it hasn't at all. And if I look at this game and you know what? I think Lopetegui is right in that the injuries have affected his team. He claims that VAR was against his team. I'm not sure what he saw Rafa Mir's first goal and... Yeah, I, I saw I saw the goals back on the offsides. Yeah, I, I don't think that <laughs> deserves to be called off as a goal. The first goal that Rafa scored that was called off. Yeah, that, that one, I felt it was a bit harsh that they called that one off. Yeah, but, but you are right in that. Sevilla, they, they sort of give a Jekyll and Hyde impression at home, regardless of how the injuries are, the absences, COVID... They play very strongly at home. Like you saw what happened against when they played against Betis, who were in form at that point. And they, they play them off the park at home, but then they go away to Alaves, who were struggling, Rayo, who were without a win, I believe, in La Liga in 2022. Yeah. And the first half, it was all Rayo. They had zero shots up until they scored the goal. And um, yeah, like it's another of those performances. And I don't know whether what's is going to take for Sevilla to fix this team. I don't know whether it's going to be something that might be fixed next season. I really worry for them going to Europe, going to play against West Ham, because let's be honest, they're higher level than Rayo and Alaves have been. And maybe the closest level to them is possibly Betis and Sevilla didn't play well and last time they went away to Betis. Yeah. Yeah, the thing is that someone like Acuna now has gotten injured again, and Augustinson hasn't impressed me one bit any time he has played for Sevilla. So I don't know how it's going to be at the London Stadium this Thursday. The, yeah. the, Sevilla still have it in them to pull a win out of Tinner. So that, that game is pretty, that game is still pretty close. Yeah, they, they do. But the problem is, it's like whenever they don't play with the spine of the team or a piece of that spine is missing, it's a totally different Sevilla. Like in the derby, Diego Carlos played, Kunde played, Fernando played. And no, Kunde was in there. Oh, Kunde was in there. Um, yeah, yeah but, but like Carlos was there, Fernando was there, and they looked so solid. They looked so assured. But Without Carlos, without Kun, I'm sorry, without Fernando, it's so that spine is gone, that protection is gone, and like we said so many times in this podcast, they lack the ability to express themselves. And let, let's move on to Real Madrid for a bit. They're in action against Mallorca tomorrow. Let's assume that they're going to win that game, and let's talk about how they managed to turn around that tie against Paris Saint Germain. Because it was almost titanic proportions, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. At halftime, the way the game was going, everyone was like, it's over. Like, PSG are, are superior, they're getting to every ball. Real Madrid at some point looked like they were giving up. Like, I saw 
Vinicius and Benzema and some other players just said it's over until somebody came up clutch for them. Yeah, Benzema. And no, no not him, Donnarumma. Donnarumma, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah, but the, the thing is that that always happens to Benzema. They happen to yeah, it, Ben all right. The guy's guy a blood. <laughs> yeah. And the guy knows how to sniff for weaknesses. In fact, he smells, he smells fear. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as much as we can say Don Irma was bad, Benzema was very good. And honestly, I'll say that's the easiest hat trick he'll score in his career. Yeah. I, I know it feels weird given the proportion of the game, but, you know, it's Don Irma and Don Irma did what he did. Did, yeah. And, P- it, it, and PSG fell apart. Oh, the collapse was incredible. And it's it's crazy that Donnarumma, given how high of a level he is, he makes that sort of mistake. It's not something that you expect from him. Like, this is a keeper who's won the Euros, who's, like, highly respected in Italy and in Europe. And to make that mistake was, was shocking. But apart from the mistake, I really, I think with Benzema, what highlights his intelligence is that second goal. Because, yeah. I, and I said this on Twitter, like, the way he moves to keep himself on side for that second goal was was genius because any other forward would have been trigger happy and would have found himself to be offside but he had that like peace of mind that like knowledge of space to like delay his run to even move on side a bit and then go for the ball and that that was that was brilliant from him yeah this one is one like every year he gets better I don't know what he's eating in the morning, but it's working. <laughs> yeah. like he, he's always been a very smart footballer, but then he's, well, since Ronaldo left, he stepped up into being the main man. And yeah, a great hat trick to carry Real Madrid into the round of, into the quarterfinals. Yeah, he's eating some good ever. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so Kamavinga and, and Fede Valverde, they were also like highlights of that game. And there's just the Madrid. And I feel that sub- those substitutions made a difference because this was a game where I don't think Real Madrid needed to have control of the game, but they needed to have like that fight, that intensity, that passion. Yes. And yeah, it was chaotic. And those were that's what those two players brought into the game. And it makes me question, like, and I think we can maybe question Tony Cruz in this game because it's another Champions League game where. He's not been at his best. And those two younger players come in and they look fresher. They look more ready for European football. The current model of European football asks of midfielders. Yeah. I'll say for just Tuesday alone, it, it was down to him being rushed back. Yeah. Because even by how he has played in the league, this, he wasn't up to um, par. And yeah, you're right. There are games that just need chaos. Like there's no, the only team that should be worried about control in that game should have been PSG. Real Madrid should have from minutes one tried to make PSG have as little of the ball for as long as possible. And they eventually did it. You know, it took them a while. And as they did it, PSG broke down and Real Madrid got what they deserved. Yeah. And on the balance of play, do you think this that result has more to do with PSG breaking down, bottling it, whatever adjective you want to use, or is it just Real Madrid being resilient, having that spirit? It's a bit of both. I think it's the thing is that when you get your first goal from such a mistake, yeah, because up to that point, I, we we don't know what would have happened after. Maybe Real Madrid would have still scored three, yeah. because PSG are very fragile. So I I think it's a bit of both. PSG's soft mentality and Real Madrid, you know, never said that attitude. Yeah, well, Real Madrid had a fantastic week in Europe, but the other side of El Clasico, Barcelona, they they didn't have one. They struggled against Galatasaray, but. They, they made they made up for the goals against Osasuna. Ferran Torres finally knowing what it is to hit the ball in the back of the net. Aubameyang scoring again. And my dad was saying it was such a great performance. Even Ricky Puig scored a goal. 
<laughs> you know what? I need to apologize to the push because when I saw him coming on, I'm like, why? Two minutes later, he made me shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fair, fair play, fair play. Yeah. The Galatasaray game was very annoying, especially the first half because we didn't create anything then. In the second half, when we brought on the right players, they improved us, but our on loan goalie had to produce a masterclass. To <laughs> yeah. And now Barca, they have to go to Galatasaray, which is an, it's not the easiest of grounds to go to. Like maybe they're not the best of teams at the moment, but mm-hmm. having that pressure and then in two or three days having to play El Clasico, that's, that's going to be tough for them to navigate. Yeah, which is why tonight it was very helpful that we more or less ended the game before halftime and could rest some players and we have get and focus on Galatasaray first and foremost. And after that, hopefully, no one is injured and we can go take on Real Madrid. And there, there's like optimism among the Barca, like. Definitely coming from Laporta, who's like, who's ever the optimist, and he thinks that Barcelona have a chance in, in the league. And that's the message that Xavi is also carrying. Do you see Barcelona making a difference if, let's say, Real Madrid are to slip up at Mallorca, which is very unlikely, and Barca do win on Sunday? Do you see there's a chance of them fighting for the league title? If that, if those two teams happen and we're six points behind them, is it six? So it'll be six. It'll be six, but that's assuming Barca also win against Raya in the game ahead. So potentially six points. Yes. Then I'll say it's, then I will acknowledge that we might be in a title race. So then I'm not even sure we'll finish second. Like, I know Laporta is the optimist. I'm taking the rule of being the best because you yeah. can't get carried away over one or two good months, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I'll say if like maybe playing like Devil's Acquity for La Porta, like Madrid still have to go to Osuna away, they start to play Sevilla away, Atletico away, Salta away. Barca maybe they have Betis away and um and I believe Real Sociedad away, but a lot of their games are at at home and Barca proved that they are very strong at the Camp Nou. A lot of their tough games are at home and Barca proved that they're strong in the Camp Nou. So maybe that's what he's looking at, looking at them. But, and going into this game, it's obvious that Barcelona has improved. They're possibly the, they're the best team in Spain since the start of the new year. Do you see there's a chance of them beating Real Madrid? There's a chance of us beating them, but it's not about how well we play. When we get a chance, we have to be ruthless. Too many times this season, we have gotten numerous chances and we've wasted them. Especially with Real Madrid, those guys are like cockroaches. We just saw that on Tuesday. You, you have to absolutely bury them to get to, like you need to score. I think it was Algarcil that said last week you need to score two goals against them to be sure they're going to win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because they are they're very dangerous and efficient. And even when they are exposed, Courtois comes up big. Militao has been improving every game this season. So it's not going to be easy. Yeah. At all. Yeah, it's not going to be easy at all for Barcelona. And let's move on to the other Madrid side, the other big Madrid side, Atletico. <sighs> they were awful against Cardiff. For me, I think this is possibly the worst performance of Atletico Madrid at home since they played against Mallorca. They created nothing, no intensity, nothing. I, I don't know how they won this game, but somehow they managed to win this because I believe Cadet lives or something. But again, your favorite referee, the bald short man. It was him. <laughs> he called this game. And oh, thank it, God I didn't watch <laughs> And it was chaotic. It really was chaotic because... He possibly should have sent for any auto off. He yeah, I saw, I saw that one. He should have, Ronaldo should have gone. He starts giving the yellow cards like candy. He calls absolutely everything that there is to call. And the game has 
no flow whatsoever. And it's it's funny that you know a referee is bad when Catholic people are annoyed. The Atletico people are annoyed. <laughs> and yeah, but the game aside, Joao Felix again scored. Llorente played a nice one too for Rodrigo de Paul to score. Negreta scored on Cadiz end. But seeing this game from Atletico Madrid and seeing Cristiano Ronaldo score a hat-trick against Tottenham Hotspur over the weekend, should Atleti fans be worried about what's happening? Um, I, 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 I think they should be too worried. Why? Because Christi- why? Because Cristiano Ronaldo is someone who's over yes. the years he's buried them. Yeah, true. They should be worried about that. But I don't know. It seems that no two games of football are the same. Yeah. No two weekends are the same. So we might see a totally different Cristiano and my United on um, Tuesday. Yeah, because it seems that while Cristiano played well, my United were their usual average selves. So bar, it things that they're basically banking on him to produce a masterclass. And that's not a solid enough plan to go in the Champions League. You know, yeah. so. And then for Atleti, they just need to focus on what they can control. Yeah. Like you said, the things that they were missing on Friday, intensity, yeah. um, organization, control, they need to have that against Man United. Because if they go to my United and just act passive, it's going to be so disappointing because my United are definitely there for the taking. Yeah, they definitely are. And the one area where, from an athletic point of view, where I'll be really scared is that early they don't really convince me. They don't really, they're like a team where they're so weak when it comes to defending crosses, defending from corners. I'm not too sure what I'm going to, what we're going to get from them, but. Yeah, so it's it's gonna be quite interesting. United said obviously they, they would have Bruno Fernandez out and um Scott Is that? due to COVID. Okay, yeah, it's possible that he might be out due to COVID. So that's something that a theme that we would have to watch and see. But yeah, yeah it's gonna be interesting for them. It's also gonna be interesting for Real Betis, who disappointed on Thursday against Frankfurt. And I think f- the best thing for Real Betis was the 2-1 scoreline to the 2-1 yeah. loss because it could have been a lot worse. Frankfurt absolutely killed them on the counter-attack. Yeah. I don't know what Claudio Bravo is doing for that first goal <laughs> or the second, but yeah, they, they were they were disappointed. Yeah. I, I simply don't know why Bravo has been starting the last few games. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, because a lot of the goals they've conceded are very avoidable. Very, yeah. Even the, even in going all the way back to the derby, right? Like I feel he could have done better in the penalty. I feel he could have done better for a near second goal. Mm-hmm. But he's a keeper that he has the faith of his manager. Maybe it's nepotism because they come from the same country. Who knows? <laughs> but, but. But to give him credit, like in the game against Frankfurt, he did make a lot of good saves to keep the scoreline at 2 1. And going into Germany, how do you see Betis? Because they definitely improved against Athletic. Miranda came back in, maybe that helped, and he was able to provide a cross for Boyer Iglesias. And they played some fantasy stuff in the first half and the second half, too, before Fakir lost his head. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the fact that they have. An actual left back means that there's more balance to the team. Depending on who they can get fit for um, Thursday, they could go through. They just have to, like you say, cut out the stupid mistakes and, you know, um, just try and. At, at this point, you're behind, you might as well go for it instead of being too passive and just waiting for Frankfurt to hit you on the break. Yeah. But the good thing about it is, like, unlike Sevilla, like, I feel Betis, they're more, they're a team that's more dynamic. They're a team that will go for yeah. it. Like, with Sevilla, I would worry for them in the case against West Ham that they would wait for West Ham to come to them. And that might be a losing strategy, especially when you're away from home and it's only 1-0. And 
the English crowd, like English clubs, they're used to like getting the epic, going, having amazing comebacks. And that's not something that Sevilla should encourage. But I, I doubt Betis would be the same. I think they will go for it. So I'm not too worried in that sense. Whether they have the ability to turn the tie, who knows? Yeah. yeah. Let's move on to Real Sociedad. They won comfortably, or not comfortably, they won 1 0 against Alaves. It was, it was a, more of a game of attrition in this game, but they keep on racking up the wins. They're still there, there, thereabouts. They're six points behind Atletico. They're two. I'm, I'm sorry, they're four points behind Atletico. They're two behind Betis. What do we think about them? Do, you, do we think they've improved since they got slapped by Real Madrid? Or are there things I mean, that... It, yeah, I, I think we have another Draco and White case here. At home, they're solid. They don't create enough to score more than one goal, but at least at home, they're very, very solid because they have 11 clean sheets in 14 home games. Away from home in 2022, that's where their big problems have been, because away from home, they just, they just been picking up really bad results. Results, yeah. yeah. And what's, so, what's up with Alexander Isak? Because he has not been the same player since last season. And yeah. I know we can see that for a number of players, like Yusuf Hanazri from Sevilla has not been the same, but Isak's case is so striking, because last season he could you could count on him every other game to score some goals but this season he's looked out of form he's looked uninspired he looks to lack that tiger instinct in the box yeah it's not just him the Porto as well have been has really done great from last season the only forwards that have have been good or okay have been Fabel and Yanzai Sarlot was good for a while, then he's faded up. And I feel it's just the down to the general lack of creativity that they have. Because I don't think the forwards are getting the chances they be getting last season to score. Yeah. It feels like they're going through a similar problem with Sevilla. I wonder whether it's going to be something that's fixed through a new signing or something that's fixed maybe with a change of system or just training and it's something that's going to take a new season for it to be fixed. It, feel, it feels like at this point in the season, if it hasn't been fixed, you need new signings to fix it mm. or new ideas come the summer. Yeah, that's true. Well, Hot and Ross is that stroll is Villarreal and they are six points behind Atletico Madrid. It seemed in this game that they were really thinking about Juventus <laughs> and they somehow they got the job done. Danny Parrick was scoring a goal and he dedicated his goal to Alberto Moreno, who picked up an injury last week. Mm-hmm. How do you see them in the tie against Juventus? Because Juve, they picked up form since mm-hmm. they last met with Villarreal. They disappointed last week. This week, they were okay. Mm-hmm. Do we still see them having a chance to go in and going through in Turin? Yeah, they still have a chance. I mean, they, st- they have less of a chance than I thought three weeks ago because Juve have improved. Yeah. But but then I, I think it depends on you. If Juve play very passive, Villarreal have every chance of going there, provided they're not so passive themselves. Yeah. But I feel the big problem Villarreal have is the lack of in number nine. Yeah. I don't get why Emery doesn't want to start to the idea because Danjuma is not going Danjuma is going to be wide trying to cause problems there and that lack of a central presence to occupy Chiellini, Bonucci and the leaks will be an issue for them. Yeah it will be especially now that Alvaro Morata is like banging in the goals on the other half. It's and Gerard Moreno, we're not sure when he's going to be back, whether we'll be able to make it for this game. It really could be an issue. And you are right, like Dangema is like on the wings, Samu is on the other wing, Lok also is not a forward. Mm-hmm. So it's it's difficult to see where that creativity is going to come from. 
they could try playing Jeremy Pino as a strike. I don't know. Yeah. It's just something random I thought after that is four goal haul against Mario. <laughs> like some of his movements were pretty like instinctive, like a striker would say. Yeah, they, that they could were, be an option. They were, but when you're playing against Juventus, right? You're playing against three huge center backs. Yeah. I, I feel I feel maybe a Mary like could just play DR there. And just to deal with the, the physicality that that game will require of Yeah. Or he's not, he's just not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's just not going to do it. Yeah, it's, it's the thing with Unai Emery. He's always like very stubborn, very cautious. He gets the job done. That's why he's been a respected manager for so long. Uh, fingers crossed for them in Europe. Yeah. Moving on, like we're going to have a Valenciano theme to the worst game I've ever seen in my life, Hatafe versus Valencia. I don't know what was going to my head when I decided I'm going to spend 90 minutes of my life to watch this game, but luckily I was cooking at the same time, so at least I got a good meal out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know the thing? Because my schedule was so busy on Saturday, I was actually upset I was going to miss this game. <laughs> you don't think... <laughs> yeah. I, all I did, right... I yeah. just asked a question. Hey guys, how was the game? I've never received so many comments before on Twitter. People were <laughs> angry. <laughs> I, I don't know what they were playing, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't football because there was a foul. It was either a foul, a throwing, a goal kick, or a corner in every minute. Like more, more, like more bees than minutes in the game. So imagine yeah. the stoppages. That and we're in this game. We need to see the effective playing time. <laughs> yeah, I'm desperate to see it because I'm sh- pretty sure it'll be possibly 39, even less. <laughs> yeah, 39 was like just tragic. 40 something is low enough for it. Yeah, I, I know it, it was a it was a tragic game to watch. <laughs> but we it seems like let, let's go on a macro level. It seems like we're or last season we saw more of this style in Spain in Spanish football. Why is it that this style has come to fruition? Because, like, these are two, they're not minnows. Like, Hetafe, they, yeah. they used to be a minnow, but they're not minnows playing this style. Why is it that it's become so popular in recent years? Because the referees are getting worse and they don't know how to control games. The referees basically encourage you to make silly fouls all the time and stop play because the referees don't know how to allow a game flow. The simple concept of playing the advantage really is referring to half of the referees in this league. Yeah. And something you notice, whenever I watch Champions League, for example, when a player goes on the floor, the referee plays on most of the time. Yeah. But in Spain, it's different. It's when a player goes on the floor, if the player shouts, the referee exactly. immediately changes his mind, decides that this was the most dangerous tackle I've ever seen, Gives them a yellow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The referees go based off rea- the players' reactions way too much. Like yeah. you see them making silly delayed reactions, delayed <laughs> decisions. It's like why? And you're like, mate, you, you didn't think this was a foul two minutes ago or two seconds ago, <laughs> and now you yeah. think it's a yellow. It's going to be a yellow. But yeah, uh, I I don't know, but hopefully. We, in the future, we can see the games have more fluid. So, and that's why I like Mateo Lajos. Many people don't like him. Even in the Betis Athletic game, I was criticized because he allowed lots of hard tackles. But I feel the flow should always come first. And yeah. as long as the players aren't going overboard, when players start going overboard, that's when you start giving the yellow cards. But you should always allow the game to breathe, especially in the first half. Exactly. Yeah. But the best game of the weekend for me was Granada Elche, especially in the first half. And this was an early morning game. I slightly early in the morning in North America, I woke up and I was watching this game. I was like, wow, this game has so much flow to it because Granada crew was recruiting chances, Elche recruiting chances. Yeah, that's it seemed like that. Yeah. And with Elche, it was it was such a huge win for them because it's a win that takes them, I believe, to 32 points. And we could say they're, they're safe. Safe, yeah. I think they're safe now. Because 
you sometimes 35 points is enough to see you safe. So I, I think we're in a position where Elche have secured their safety, especially since it's against Granada. Yeah. And a player that really impressed me in this game was Peremia. He 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 controlled the strings of the game. Like his passing was good, his work rate was good. He was like he was almost like Mesut Ozil on his prime <laughs> to give him that. Yeah. And I know I know you really like him. So mm-hmm. do you see him moving up to a bigger club after the season? I think he'll stay at LG. I don't think he's going to move on. Maybe I think if a club makes an offer, he'll move, but at the moment, I don't see, I don't see like any club make, like really moving for him. If Elche stay up, if Elche were to go down, definitely people would get him because he's really, really good. And yeah, I don't know if he continues next season and he get and like he starts from the start of the season. Because remember, he only got back into the team when Francisco came. So if he's a regular and he gets maybe double digits, possibly, then yeah, he could be destined for bigger teams. Yeah, and let's talk about Granada for a bit because they had more possession, they had more shots, but it seems like they're super inefficient and that's what's going to kill them because I feel they're a team that have way better quality than Cadet, Alaves, mm-hmm. possibly the same as Levante, but because they, their lack of efficiency is what's costing them in this dogfight and relegation zone. Yeah, exactly. Like this takes me back to the game they had against Villarreal, that 4 1 against yeah. them. If you watch that game, you'll know that game was not a 4 1. Because yeah. Granada should have scored three in the space of 10 minutes. But whether like they were just so inefficient with their chances. Yeah. Luis Suarez in particular, like his goals have dried up. I feel that's what has really made them suffer. He hasn't scored in what is it six or seven games, and Molina hasn't scored since last year. Yeah, so you look at it and you're like, Where are the goals going to come? That, that, that is true. That is true. Levante, we all thought like they still have a chance, they're six points behind Granada. Mm-hmm. They should have got to the penalty against Espanol, though. Yeah, they should have. That was, I don't that get was these scandalous. referees, that was a scandalous decision. Yeah. And to see something like that and not go to bar, that was crazy. Yeah, I think that's my biggest problem with the referees in Spain. There's so many times they can use bar and they don't even consider it because if they look at bar, for sure they're going to give the decisions. I don't even, I don't know what's going on there. I have no idea either. But moving to corporate news for Espanol, the rumor is they might be getting sold to American investors for 300 million. Imagine. <laughs> they could be yeah. the new, they could be the new Mexico City. Just joking. <laughs> uh, American boxing's be enough to make to the new Mexico City. But <laughs> you know, if we, if they come with a very good project, they could make us by all a like a team that regularly change for changes for European positions. Yeah. Like because they were in the Europa League not too long ago with almost the same squad. Yeah. And which the, is why it's confusing why they are so low on the table. True. The squad is not a bad one. Like they have good young players coming up. They have some experienced players. They have Rowdy Tomas. It's not a, I would say if you were to improve the squad, maybe to the level of Betis or Villarreal, it wouldn't take a lot of money, in my opinion. It wouldn't take too much money. Just buy some, like use smart money to buy some center backs in particular. Yeah. They definitely need to improve that. Definitely. And then maybe another another goal scoring winger in there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that that does it for La Liga. Let's fly over to Italia where into Milan. They they, they keep dropping points. Yeah, it looked as that's the thing with Syria. Every other month it looks like one team is going to run away with it and then they decide to 
like um, slow down. In, in January, it was Napoli. Over the last month, it was Inter. It might be AC Milan next month, we don't know. I hope it's not that close yeah. because I want Milan to win the league. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because Milan, they, they're in a comfortable position right now. They're three points ahead. Inter, they slap the game in hand. They're four points behind Milan. Milan, they won against Empoli. So it, it's starting to look good for them. It's starting to look good. Like a couple of weeks ago, we wouldn't have thought that they would be in this position given how strong Inter looked. But now we see them top of the table. So your prediction might be right. And they have a good run of fixtures because they've already played UV. They've played against Inter themselves. They've played against Napoli and they got seven points from those three games. So that's like the six point, their six pointers are basically taken care of. So yeah, yeah. And with UV, which is my prediction to win say, yeah. I'm still crazy it's about nice. that. <laughs> yeah. Uh there's just seven points off Milan. They're three points away from Inter Milan. And it's it's honestly it's crazy how well you have done over the last year, the improvements they've made. Maybe it's just Duzan Vlajovic that's changed this team, but it it's like again, like I said last week with Juve, Barcelona, and Arsenal, they've they've radically changed everything. Yeah, because yeah, when you look at it, Juve haven't lost in like. They haven't lost since November in the league. Yeah. Sorry, not November. Yeah, since November. They have lost since November in the league. And yeah, the signing of Lovic has really improved them. It's also improved Morata, similarly, because, like I said, competition can bring the best out of you. And Morata is now amongst the goals, too. Even though the Bala is injured, they've still managed to claw themselves into. Somewhat of a title race. Yeah. Yeah, at this point, I think they'll finish fourth. They'll finish fourth. Yeah. And that's because Atlanta, they've they've gone off the ball. Really, they drew 0 0 to Genoa. But in the Europa League, they, they were brilliant in, in the game against Labour Cousin. Yeah, they were. They were. In... Go on, go on. Yeah. So I was just moving on to the bonus league. Uh, Labour Cousin, they, they lost this weekend to Korn. Bayern Munich drop points against uh, Hoffenheim, which leaves the door open to Borussia Dortmund because... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to believe it, bro. You have to believe it because Dortmund right now, they're seven points behind Bayern. If they it's a win, game in hand. With a game in hand. If they win that game in hand, they could push it to four points and they still have to play Bayern Munich. And I believe it's going to be in the Signa in Duna Park. No, it's going to be at the Allianz. Can be at the Allianz. Oh wow, that's so. You're telling me they have no hope. <laughs> Listen, the thing is that if Holland is fit, they have a chance. But Holland has been out of action for a long time, so I don't know. But he if came back. He came back to action today. Oh, well, he did. Okay. Yeah, if I'm not. They wrong. have a chance. Yeah. The thing with Dortmund is best to just take it one game at a time. If yeah. they beat Bayern and they win the Bundesliga, like that, that'll be very nice, honestly. No, it, it will be. It will be. But my worry is that I, I thought the game was going to be at Signa Iduna Park, but knowing it's going to be at the Allianz, I would worry for Dortmund because they they never do well in that stadium. Like, there are times when I've gone in with hope and I'm switching off TV at halftime because it's like 4 0, 5 0. So. The, the last time was even worse because we were 2 0 up. <laughs> I came fucking 10 minutes and they could have been 3 0 up at the point. But yeah. after that, miss, somebody makes a mistake at the back because Bayern, their pressure is relentless. So, yeah. Yeah. And let's go t- over to England for a bit. Liverpool, they won 2 0 against Brighton, which further puts the pressure in Manchester City. As I mentioned, Arsenal again, they're like they're really improving, they're really doing well. They beat Leicester, and it seems like they have a comfortable position in that support. Yeah, it's um really comfortable right now because they have three games in hand over Man United. 
One of them is against Liverpool, bro. So, and it's this Wednesday. So is it a Roma way? Yes, that's home. So, so, so they, they could yeah. have a pass. Yeah, they have a pass. The other game in hand is against Tottenham. It's a derby, but so yeah, that could go either way. Tottenham are also in the race for <laughs> Europe. Yeah. But I always feel like in all those big derbies, especially the ones that are like somewhat close, the the bigger team usually has that advantage. Like you look at the Seville, Seville Derby, it's Sevilla usually wins that. In the Madrid mm-hmm. derbies, it's Madrid. Uh, yeah. so yeah. And it is that we in North London Derby, it's been up and down over the last few years. There's a time where Tottenham hadn't lost in a long time up until Last year, when Odegaard scored against Tottenham, and since then, Arsenal have won the like previous two. So, yeah, it's, it's been interesting. And it will be remiss without visiting England without talking about Chelsea's situation. Yes, they did win this weekend to a late goal by Kaya Havertz. They have the Champions League against Lille, but the big issue is Roman Abramovich sanctions. Apparently, they have no money. They're broke, Chelsea. <laughs> I saw something you thought would happen in since 2003. Yeah, it's it's a it it, it I'm surprised it took as long as they did to apply sanction on Bremovich. And he did try to like at least sell the club or start the process of selling the club, but then the league is saying that you know if you are going to sell the club, we'll be the ones to handle the sale for you. You won't get any percentage of it. And yeah, I, I think from Abraham's point of view, he's always wanted to protect Chelsea in this whole thing. So I can see their situation resolving if everything like if like he cooperates and lets whoever is going to sell the club to the new the potential bidders do it. True, true. But the problem with sales of the size is it usually takes a long time and yeah what people it's not going to be resolved in and I, I don't think it's resolved by june or july yeah because it could it's you're, we're talking about figures that could be three billion four billion whatever and you're going to need lots of people together like pe- you're going to need people to come up with that the due diligence is going to take time it could be expedited but it's something that's going to be a lot more complex than a lot of people think, yeah. given the nature and the gravity of the sale and the risk that comes with it. Because if they sell to someone who is not going to take care of the club, I mean, that's a pretty common thing in English football where you get bad owners that don't like that promise he will do this for the club and that they don't do it. Derby County are an example. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll be difficult to find an owner who will spend as much as a Brown did. Yeah, that's another that's a, that's a problem they have from that time. Yeah. They, I feel if they do get a new owner, it will possibly spend the way the owners of Liverpool do, the owners exactly. of Arsenal do. Because Abramovich wasn't there for the money. He was there for the glory. Exactly. So he didn't have any problem releasing funds to them. And then, yeah. It's, other owners of other teams that are not Man City is different. They're more um, like they won't spend unless they feel they absolutely have to. Yeah, like he has, I believe, close to two billion pounds of debt with Chelsea or two billion euros of debt. Like he's loaned Chelsea that money. And that's that's a crazy staggering amount to spend on a football club. But and it might be different. Who knows if they sell it to Saudi owners, <laughs> they might get the same amount of investment. But thinking about mega rich oil rich clubs, uh, PSG, we started almost with them, we're gonna end with them. Uh, your boy Messi and Neymar, they got booed this weekend. PSG won comfortably against Bordeaux. It seems like they're going to win the league. But where does Paris Saint Germain go from there? Because the rumor is Mbappe is going to leave in the summer. Is that a rumor? Hey. Or a fact? <laughs> hey, we don't know, right? We don't know. Stranger things can happen in football, right? But if, if Mbappe does leave this team and goes to a team which shall not be named, um, 
what changes can they make? Because Messi is in the twilight of his career. Neymar seems like he retired three years ago. <laughs> and they need another player. Obviously, if someone of Mbappe's caliber goes into get someone as good as him, the thing is that he's he's one of he's a one of the kind players. So I don't know that they I whoever is going to come in isn't going to be exactly his kind of role. They'll have to change how they play. I know Lewandowski is thinking about leaving or something. Maybe they could try him or if Ronaldo. Besides, so leave my United is an option. Yeah, Messi, you find Messi Ronaldo, <laughs> link up. You say Ronaldo, link up. <laughs> With Zidane as coach. <laughs> at, at this point, since Messi left Barcelona, my dream of him being a one club man, dad, like, I'm open to anything. <laughs> and and do, do you think the boos were fair on Messi? I, I was pretty harsh with him on Twitter, but I don't think he played a good game on Tuesday. Yeah. For most it seems that. Yeah. The thing is that I, th- I thought the him and the rest of the team were okay, but the way they all collapsed, that was there's no excuse for that. No. I mean, I, you, believe me, I was harsh with him too. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm like, you can't, you can't just, you can't lose your head like that. You know? Yeah. You can't just like I feel the problem is he ghosted, and yeah, he, go- Neymar, he ghosted. Neymar ghosted as well. Mbappe ghosted after. 60 minutes as well. And that's the issue with having a team like PSG or that or that specifically front line is you get the same problems that Barcelona had when Messi was there with Suarez. Mm-hmm. It's that you have when you have two or three players who don't track back, you leave your team open to all sort of all sorts of attacks, all sort of comebacks, unless you're very dominant. And I know some people were like, oh, they're playing Liga. I don't believe in that. Like, crap, I feel Obviously, it's, that, it's systemic. Because if Di Maria was there, and he would have tracked back. Sure. I don't understand why Mauricio Pochettino decided to keep Neymar on for the entire game or Messi on for the entire game. He should have brought Di Maria on, in my opinion, to bring the balance back into the game. Once they or went four zero down, oh, you shouldn't have even take taking Paredes off. Oh, yeah, yeah, because Paredes is underrated. He controlled the game, but I think uh, Paredes' issue was that he got a stupid yellow card. Yeah, and the game was going away from them. So Pochettino was like, "Let's probably not go down to ten men." Yeah, as for the booze, I don't know. I mean, every fan has their right to go on it. Yeah, I don't think Neymar and Messi have. Been bad that they don't care about the club or anything. I'm not going to go overboard and say, hey, why should like no players above me? Because Barcelona fans were good messy before. Yeah. It's nothing new for him. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't watch PSG all the time, so I don't know exactly how he's playing, but I don't think it's a situation where he or Neymar or anyone else are putting themselves above the club like the ultras are saying. Uh, I feel the problem is maybe you get the stars that PSG always wanted, Messi, Neymar, yeah. Cristiano. You get them on big wages, they're big mega signings. They're more like yeah. the lactical signings, like the kind of Florentino used to do. Yeah. They're easy scapegoats. Yeah, they're scapegoats. And the thing is, I'll say Messi hasn't, based on his statistics, right? His goals... Maybe maybe he's done well in assists, but like when you sign Leo Messi, yeah, expect better. You sign him to score goals. You sign him to to be more active. But I don't know. Maybe the PSG player, the PSG fans who are watching right now, they haven't seen the Messi of Barcelona because he's not the same guy he was yeah. all those years ago when he when he was scoring fifty goals a season, forty goals a season. He was younger. Yeah. He was very active. Uh, he, not, like his game over the last two or three years has been more about efficiency and like banking on like those chances that normally don't go in for other players. Yeah, and but nowadays, to- like those chances that like he just hits one time and now hitting the post or going slightly wide. So yeah, I don't yeah, know. and he's like presenting a sophomore. Yeah, I think with Messi, he should just focus. He should change his game. 
in a way. Like, yeah. if you're going to commit to the midfield that team, like, just commit to it at this point. Yeah. And going forward for the PSG project, where do you see it? Because their aim, obviously, is to elevate the French game and to win the Champions League, to be the first French team to win the Champions League in close to, I believe, close to like 30 years. Do you see a possibility of that being achieved in the future, in the near term, maybe even next season? Or is it something that it's more of a long term? They have to radically change everything to achieve. They need a coach that will have his a strong personality. That's the first thing. Coach either needs to be stronger in his personality or just go at once. Because you, you can and you because as a strong coach, you won't allow your dictatorial board to make decisions for you. Yeah, yeah that's the first thing. Second thing. I, this is this is not really my suggestion, but I've seen someone say this: like utilize the talent in your own league more. Like yeah. get players from maybe Rens that are doing well or something instead of letting them go to other leagues and shine and then score against you in Champions League finals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's that's that's the thing. It's not even players from their own league; it's players from their own academy. Because exactly. in the Bundesliga, you have Onkunku, Diadi from the PSG academy. Coman, who the famous example who scored against them from their academy. They have so many great talented players like Gonzalo Guedes from their academy, Lochelso from their not not from their academy, but played with them. It was yeah. with them where they played with them. And Liga is a hotbed of talent. Most of the top players in England and Spain and Italy, they come from Liga. Mm-hmm. It's even like Mike Manian, who plays in Milan. He could have been at PSG for, yeah. and because he was with Lille. Kamavinga, who just moved to Real Madrid, he could have played for PSG. So I, I do I do agree with that. And yeah. I, I believe that's a good point to end it on. Uh, we did a lot of PSG talk, but it was great having you on yeah, to talk it was about great being on. Being on. And before we go, like one more one more prediction. Who do you think is gonna go through Ajax or Benfica? I'm going to go with Benfica. But I'm going to say Benfica will shock everyone. Benfica will shock everyone. I think Ajax does it. But again, nice having you on. And uh, hopefully nice being here. We'll talk about our Clasco and all the Spanish teams going out next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Adios, guys. Take care.